Good morning, Emmanuel Aurelia. If you're joining us online, we want to welcome you. We're so excited to see so many of you here with us in the auditorium. And if you're at home and you're like, man, I just want to come back, but I'm not sure. Am I taking up spots? We do have seats available. We'd love to have you back here whenever you're comfortable. If this is your first time joining us here at Emmanuel, we want to say a special welcome to you. If you're joining us online, please make sure to fill out the Connect card that you can find on the Facebook page by clicking the link. This morning, we're going to be continuing on in a sermon series called Conversations with Jesus, and Pastor Dave will be leading us in that. So just a few announcements. With September just around the corner, I know it's like back to school time for the kids, uh, but something that we're really excited about is our annual back to school shoe campaign. What we do is, here at Emmanuel, if you're not familiar with it, is, uh, is we try to collect 50 pairs of shoes to support families at Lions Oval Public School. That's a school that we partner with just in Aurelia here, and we're really excited to continue this partnership. And because of their location, because of socioeconomics, uh, not everybody can afford shoes. So we would love to be able to provide shoes to students in need. So if you're able to do so, we would love for you to get involved. Uh, shoe sizes range from kids JK to grade 8, so that can be kids size like youth 11 all the way up to adult 11 and 12 because, you know, we have some, some tall grade 7 and 8 students in our area that are in need as well, so we want to care for them. So if you can get on board, we'd love to have you uh, involved in that, and if we can drop off shoes by Sunday, September the 20th, that would be awesome. Next thing, we're really excited to be able to be doing a baptism service, and that's going to be coming up soon. We don't have a day yet, but if you would like to be baptized, if you've been considering being baptized or it's something you're wondering about, please connect with Pastor Matt, Pastor Josh, or Pastor Dave, and you can let them know that you're interested, and there's a whole process that you would walk through with them. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing how a baptism in COVID would play out. I don't know if we've got a crane that's going to be dunking people or not or how that's all going to work, but we're excited to see, right, Pastor Dave? Next announcement. Uh, we're going to be making a slight change to our Sunday morning live services if you're watching from home. At this point, you're watching it on Facebook. Uh, we are going to be transitioning to our YouTube channel, so if you haven't checked out the Emmanuel Aurelia YouTube channel, please do so. And come September, all of our Sunday morning gatherings will be live on YouTube, so you can check that out. And lastly, uh, if you're here and you're with your family, we are so happy to see kids in here. Um, kids are very welcome. We've got tables out for families. We've got programs for them. We've got, you know, you can bring your own things. Uh, but if you find your kids are just getting a little more squirrely than you're comfortable with, maybe they're... Uh, Maybe they're distracting you. We do have the community room open downstairs, and so you can check that out. And there is a live stream happening downstairs, so you can head down to the community room. Just take the main stairs down uh, out the back there and down to the community room, and you can enjoy the service there. But we do want to make sure everybody feels welcome, so we are so happy to have you here. Uh, welcome to Emmanuel Aurelia. We are going to go into a time of worship now with Pastor Matt. Well, good morning, church. Uh, let's stand together. And uh, while uh, we still have some restrictions, uh, one thing that I love to do together is to pray by using the Psalms that God has given us. It's such an incredible way to pray together uh, because not only are these Psalms true and, and uh, really a reflection of our hearts to him, uh, but God has actually given us words to pray back to him. And so let's this morning uh, lift up Psalm 9 to him. Uh, let's, let's read this out together. And I'm going to be reading the first part, and then you'll be reading the second bolded part along with me, okay? Let's pray this together. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wondrous deeds. Let's say this together. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. When my enemies turn back, they stumble and perish before your presence. For you have maintained my just cause. You have sat on the throne, giving righteous judgment. You have rebuked the nations. You have made the, wickish, the wicked perish. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. 
The enemy came to an end in everlasting ruins. Their cities you rooted out. The very memory of them has perished. But the Lord sits enthroned forever. He has established his throne for justice. And he judges the world with righteousness. He judges the peoples with uprightness. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Sing praises to the Lord who sits enthroned in Zion. Tell among the people his deeds. For he who avenges blood is mindful of them. He does not forget the cry of the afflicted. Be gracious to me, O Lord. See my affliction from those who hate me. O you who lift me up from the gates of death, that I might recount all your praises, that in the gates of the daughter of Zion I may rejoice in your salvation. The nations have sunk into the pit they have made. In the net that they hid, their own foot has been caught. The Lord has made himself known. He has executed judgment. The wicked are snared in the works of their own hands. The wicked shall return to Sheol, all the nations that forget God. For the needy shall not always be forgotten, and the hope of the poor shall not perish forever. Arise, O Lord, let not man prevail. Let the nations be judged before you. Put them in fear, O Lord. Let the nations know that they are but men. Let's bow in prayer together. Lord, this morning, may you make evident that we together this morning are only but men. Uh, We often, along with the nation, uh, do not work for justice. Uh, We often do not love the poor as we ought to. And so, Lord, we uh, pray a prayer of repentance this morning. Uh, We do not want our hearts to be turned away from you and towards our sins. So, Lord, we pray that you this morning would convict us of sin. And although you judge us less than we ought to be, God, we pray that this morning uh, that you would lift us up as poor people in, in terms of righteousness and that, Lord, you would make us righteous. And so, Lord, we pray that these songs that we sing, uh, these songs that we hear, these songs that we contemplate this morning uh, would truly be a reflection of our heart. Like the psalmist said, I will give praise to you, Lord, with my whole heart. Uh, Lord, we pray that this morning you would be glorified, that you would be magnified, that your justice, your righteousness would be made known in this place. And so, Lord, we bring this to you now. Amen. Let's listen together. Well, good morning, church family. Let's worship our God together in spirit and in truth this morning. You were the word at the beginning. One with God, the Lord most high. Hitting glory in creation. Now reveal. What a beautiful name it is, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus, what a beautiful Left the majesty of heaven, Jesus humbly you came down. Sin was great, your love was greater. So what could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is! What a wonderful name it is! The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. 
What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. You silenced the boast of sin and grace. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again. You have no rival. You have no rival. You have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. For yours is the kingdom, yours is the glory, yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is, what a powerful name What a powerful name it is, nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. And so Right. 
Thank you, Tyler and Jeff, for leading us. Uh, what great worship. And whether you're singing along at home, singing secretly behind your mask, humming along, or, uh, or just worshiping in your mind, uh, it's so great to worship together wherever we are, here or at home. Uh, it's with some sadness, uh, great sadness, actually, that I just want to announce, and Pastor Dave will probably talk a little bit more, uh, that uh, Anita Amberge who uh, was a, a volunteer at Emmanuel Aurelia, and she often, you would probably see her at the welcome desk. Uh, she suddenly passed away this week. Uh, so if we can be praying for her family, for her husband, Dean, and her, her children, Mackenzie and Curtis, uh, that would be greatly appreciated because they've got a, a rough journey ahead, I'm sure. So we know she's with her Lord and Savior. We're excited for that. Um, but we know that the grief that the family is going to be going through, so we want to definitely keep them in our hearts and our prayers. Uh, with that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we come before you humbly, and we just want to say thank you uh, that we can worship you wherever we are, whether we're in our homes, or whether we're here in person, or, or maybe people are watching this later on in the week, wherever we are, Whenever uh, we are taking in this service, God, we are so grateful that we can worship you. Father, a lot of things have changed in our world, but you haven't. You are the one constant that has remained. So, Lord, we, we are grateful that we can reach out to you in prayer and talk to you anytime. 
We're grateful that we can open our, your, your word. We can open our Bibles and read. We can open them on an app or on our smartphone or tablet, wherever. God, we can, we can connect with you in so many different ways, and we thank you for, for that. And God, you've remained consistent through all of this. And so, Lord, as, as we, as individuals, try to push through COVID and try to figure out how to navigate things like school in September and going out and, and, uh, and how to connect with people and, and how to serve our neighbors and love on people, Lord, um, we pray that we can be seeking your wisdom and seeking your face. Uh, Lord, give us guidance in all that we say and do. Father, as we enter the service this morning, I pray that you open our ears and our hearts to hear what you want us to hear. Lord, challenge us, shape us, and guide us to be more like you. Father, um, we just, we, we want to lift up Anita's family. We want to lift up Dean and Curtis and Mackenzie as they are, as they are grieving, Father God. I pray that in the midst of their grief, that you would give them the peace that you promised in your word, Lord, the peace that surpasses all understanding. Lord, I pray that it would guide their hearts and their minds as they are, are walking this journey now uh, without Anita. Lord, I pray for her, her family and her extended family and friends. Uh, Father, please walk closely with them. Uh, God, we want to give you thanks that, that Dan Wadsworth is is progressing in his cancer treatments and and uh, we're hopeful that the surgery that is upcoming will will eradicate the cancer god we've been praying as a church we've been praying beyond our church people all around have been praying for dan and annie through this and lord it is our heart's prayer and desire that you would cure dan of this cancer that it would be wiped out from his body for good and lord you are the great physician and we know that you can do that so father please do that for our brother dan God, we're excited. Uh, in our church, there's been babies that have been born, so we thank you for Owen uh, being born to Joe and Alyssa. And God, we also want to thank you for the babies that are coming. Uh, Lord, watch over the moms that are, that are in second and third trimesters and waiting for babies. And Lord, uh, I just thank you for the blessing that new life brings in our church and, and in our world. And so, God, we thank you for the babies that are coming. We pray as well uh, for John and Patricia as they're going to be getting married this, this coming weekend. God, would you bless their marriage, their ceremony, and the day, but God, even more so, bless them as they start their lives together and, uh, and, and make a big move out to British Columbia. So, Father, be with them on their journey as they travel, uh, but be with them even more so in their lives together. Father, we thank you for marriage. We thank you for their faith and trust in you, and God, would you walk their marriage with them. Father, be with all of the marriages in our church and in our church family. Uh, God, would you be strengthening the roles of husbands and wives as they love each other and, and serve one another? God, I, I pray that in all of the marriages, God, that you would be the third person in there, that, that, uh, that husbands and wives would put their trust in you and their love in you and their care for one another. God, give us eyes for our spouses only. Uh, God, for the families, we pray that you would be strengthening families. We pray that you would be strengthening the faith of children and youth, and young adults, and adults, and, and, uh, and seniors, God, we just, we pray for growing faith and trust in you. God, we're, we're thankful that in the midst of all of this, um, you know, COVID and, and uncertainty, God, that you are moving. God, we are so thankful that the Arabic church plant in Barrie is, is making strides and getting to know and connect with Arabic-speaking people in Barrie. We pray for the Northbury church plant as it's preparing to launch. Even though it's going to be different than originally planned, we pray for, for Pastor Jordan as he is preparing to launch with his core team there. And God, we just give you thanks that in the midst of all this, that you are moving. So Father, uh, we pray that, that you would not be stopped, that the gospel would not be stopped by COVID-19. Father, as, uh, as we go into the service now, I just I humbly ask you to join us. Lord, allow us to hear what your Holy Spirit wants us to hear um, and put us right in tune with what we need to walk away with this service or from this service with, Lord God. Thank you for all the ways that you've blessed us, Lord God. Amen. Matthew, chapter 12, verse 31 and 32. So, here's what I tell you. Every kind of sin and every evil word spoken against God will be forgiven. 
but speaking evil things against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit won't be forgiven. A person like that won't be forgiven either now or in days to come. Well, church family, it is so good again to be back with you. And for those of you online, we are so glad that you're joining with us online. And again, I want to say this. I said this last week. But I want to say this this week, again, we love kids uh, here at Emmanuel. As you could tell by just even the video, we are trying to include kids as much as we can possibly can. And there is, for those of you online not being able to see kind of the full uh, breath here of everyone who's here, there is a lot of kids here. So kids, I did this last week, and you kind of did a good job, but I need a little bit more oomph this morning. So I'm going to ask you on the count of three to say, I love kids church okay so i want to hear as loud as you can you can scream in church and murray you know what you're a kid at heart you could do this too so on the count of three i love church one two three ah uh, see that is good music to my ears it's so good and for for those of you who um, are not here or wondering about the service here, we, uh, we love kids. You can bring your kids. We have tables in front of the families. We have spaces that if they do need to go, um, they, they can go to those spaces. And also what we do have, uh, Amanda, our, our interim kids community uh, director, has made these booklets. If you don't have one of these booklets, you can get one so you can work through these. This is just for the kids. Not for the adults, but uh, you can grab these for the kids and they can work on these and play with these um, during the service. Um, well, we started a series, uh, beginning of the summer, that we've called Conversations with Jesus. And the premise behind this series is that while Jesus was here on earth, he had multiple conversations with multiple people. And what we're going to do throughout this summer, and we're coming up to the end of this series, is we are going to look at those conversations, eavesdrop on those conversations, in the hopes of learning some valuable lessons. And this morning we are going to look at a conversation that Jesus had and a topic that Jesus had that has turned people off of church. This conversation and this topic that we're going to look at this morning has caused people to live in unwarranted and unnecessary fear. It is also a topic that is also most often misunderstood. However, I believe it is a topic that we need to understand, we need to wrestle with, and we need to talk about even if it's so difficult to do so. And it's the topic of what is commonly called the unforgivable sin. Or another way of saying it is the unpardonable sin. Here's what you need to know. The Bible tells us that there is one sin that if you commit, that there is no going back. There is no second chance, there's no do-over, there's no forgiveness. And I don't know about you, but I, if you could look back over your life, there's probably been a few moments in your life where you have desperately needed a do-over, a second chance, forgiveness. I know in my life I've needed a lot of that. Certainly in my marriage, I've needed a lot of do-overs and a lot of forgiveness. I remember we were on our honeymoon. We were at the end of our honeymoon. We had to put all of our luggage stored away because we were waiting for the bus to come pick us up. So all of Chantel's clothes, all of her, like, all of her stuff is in the luggage, locked away, no going to get it. It's going to meet us at the airport, and we decided to go swimming. She had her hair done, makeup on, all of that. She didn't want to get her head wet, and we were playing in the pool, and there was this big, huge ball that was in the pool, and I would, had the idea of, I'll, I will jump off the side of the pool and onto the ball. So she tried to do it, and I was holding the ball for her. And she, while she jumped off of the pool, the edge of the pool, onto this ball, I had, in a split second, a, made a terrible mistake. I thought it would be a good idea to move the ball out of the way so that she would belly flop onto the water. And I did that. And I desperately wish I had not done that and I needed to call a do-over. 
A few months after I survived that, got through that, a few months later, we were living in Edmonton at this time. And uh, we just moved into uh, our new house. And uh, she was working at the bank at this time. And I got home early. I, I must have been a little bit tired. And so I went up to our room and, and I was trying to nap. If you know me, I do not nap. I cannot nap. I wish I could so desperately. But I was laying in bed trying to nap. Um, and I hear her from downstairs open the front door, and I'm like, ooh, I'm going to get her. And so I pretend, I, uh, she's calling for my name, I'm, I'm there in, in bed, and I'm just pretending to sleep. And I could hear her walk up the stairs, walk into our room, and now in my mind, I'm envisioning her walking towards our bed. And, and as I, she was doing that, I was going to scare her. I was thought in my mind, I'm going to pop up, scare her, and so she yells, and it's going to be a fun joke and all of that. However, as I was doing that, I miscalculated because she was coming and doing what a great wife would do, is come in and kiss her husband while he's napping and say that, you know, I love you, you're such a, a great man, I'm so glad I could marry you, and da 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 That's what I was going in my head in. So I miscalculated, and I jumped up out of the bed, and I screamed at the top of my lugs, lungs, and I hit her square in the nose, blood everywhere, and um, not a good thing. Desperate need for a do-over. There's a lot of times in my marriage... <laughs> There's a lot of times in my life where I needed a second chance, a do-over, desperate need of forgiveness. And here's what you need to know on the onset of this message. If you were to look in the Bible, the Bible over and over and over again tells us that God will forgive us of a number of sins. That time you messed up, even if it was the umpteenth time can be forgiven, you need to know that. That time that you used your words in a way that hurt someone, even if it was a devastating, can be forgiven. The moment where you knew God was calling you to do something and yet you did not do it, can be forgiven. That lie that you told or you are continuing to tell can be forgiven. That moment you cheated on either something or someone can be forgiven. The anger inside of you can be forgiven. The slander, the jealousy, the envy, the drunkenness that you may wrestle with can all be forgiven. You name it, the Bible tells you that it can be forgiven. We see God's miraculous and gracious forgiveness all the way demonstrated through the Bible in a multitude of different people who have done some awful things in their life. Take, for instance, Adam, the first man in the Bible who was rebellious and gave in to peer pressure, forgiven. Paul, a murderer and get, uh, a murderer and persecuted the church. He was forgiven. Abraham, who took his ma matters into his own hand and get this, gave his wife away, forgiven. Jacob, a trickster and a pathological liar, forgiven. David, an adulterer and murderer and who gave in to lust, forgiven. Rahab, a devious prostitute, forgiven. Moses, who lost his temper, forgiven. Um, Peter, who was, you know, we're going to look at next week, who uh, turned his back and abandoned his Savior, forgiven, and countless others, all the way through the Bible, we see they were all forgiven. However, the Bible says that there is one sin that if we commit, that there can be no forgiveness for. There is Eternal, eternal consequences. There is no do-over, no second chance, no forgiveness. And this sin is called the unforgivable and unpardonable sin. You may be wondering, Dave, we're in a pandemic. Why are you, why are you talking about this? This is a tough one. Here's the reason why I want to look at this this morning. I want to look at it because there may be some who are in this room and some on this line, uh, uh, watching online 
who believe that they may have committed the unpardonable or unforgivable sin. They believe maybe inside their heart that they've gone too far, they've done too much, that somehow God could never forgive them because of what they have done. And I wanna tell you, if that is you this morning here in this room or online, that is not true. I remember uh, working when I was uh, going through university I took a job because I needed a ton of money uh, so I can pay off school. And so I became a landscaper for the summer, worked long hours. And um, I remember the first day of my job, I got partnered with a guy named Chris. And as we were driving from job to job to job, he asked me, what are you going for school for? And I said, oh, I'm going to Bible college. And, and the first thing, why would you ever do that? <laughs> and then we got more talking and, and it came out that he wa was a guy that grew up going to church but stopped going to church in his college years. And so we got talking about that, and, and I'm not sharing the details, but what really burdened him is he deeply wanted to go back to church. He really wanted a relationship with God. But the one thing that was keeping him was because he felt that God would never forgive him, never accept him. He felt literally that if he walked through the doors of a church, God would strike him dead. And so I don't want you to live in that fear. I don't want you to believe that you are unlovable, that you've gone too far. That's why I want to talk about this. Another reason why I want to talk about this this morning is that because there's some of you who maybe surrendered your life to Christ. And yet after surrendering your life to Christ, you've realized that you still struggle with sin. Temptation comes into your life, like what we looked at last two weeks, and you notice that there's moments where you've given in to temptation, and so you wonder, well, maybe salvation never really took. Maybe God never really, you know, saved me. Or you feel like the, you, you should just wave the white flag and call it quits because there's, there's, you know, there's no point in going on in your Christian journey, and I want you to know that that is not true. God does love you. He does care for you. There is forgiveness you do not need to live in fear. You do not need to live in disappointment or discouragement. The other reason why I want to talk about this topic is because maybe there's some of you here this morning or watching online that maybe never read the Bible or maybe never read the Bible to its entirety and you may come across this verse that we are finding in Matthew and you may be confused, wondering, what is this? What's going on? What is Jesus saying? And is it possible that maybe I have done that? I don't want you to live in that confusion. And so this morning, I want to look at this topic and look at this conversation in the hopes that to encourage you that if you are living in fear or discouraged, wondering if you've done this, I want to encourage you that, that you probably most likely have not done it. And also, I want to do this. I want to lovingly challenge those who may be on the brink of committing this. I want to call you back home. So with all of that said, if you have your Bible this morning and if you're online and your Bible's in the next room, go grab it. Grab your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 to 32. In looking at this passage, and as you're turning there, there's, there's two things I want to do. I want to ask the question, what is the unforgivable sin, and what should this cause us to do? So let's look at what is the unpardonable sin. This is what it says in Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 to 32. It says these words, and it'll come on the screen, just in case you didn't bring a Bible. It says this, then they brought him, that's Jesus, so they brought to Jesus a man uh, who was demon-possessed, who was blind and mute. And Jesus healed him so that he could talk and he could see. And all the people were astonished and said, could this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, it is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. So pause there before we get any further, because if you're going to understand the unforgivable sin, the unpardonable sin, then you need to know what is going on in this text right now. So let me give you a picture of what is happening right here. Jesus has already stepped on the scene. He's already been going around from place to place. And what he is doing as he's going around, he's, he's teaching people and telling people who he was and why he came to earth. 
He was telling people that he was the Messiah, the long-awaited Savior of the world. He was the one that was going to come and rescue the world from their sin and guilt and bring them salvation. But not only was Jesus saying this and teaching this, he was also demonstrating this by performing many miraculous signs and wonders. And we see this in the text. Here, where he physically healed a man that was demon-possessed and blind and mute. And we see this all the way through Jesus' life. Jesus doing miraculous things, demonstrating who he was. And so what we have here is Jesus audibly proclaiming who he was and why he came and he was also demonstrating who he was and why he came and we see that in the story and did you notice what happened when the people saw Jesus do this did you see did you notice what happened when the people saw what Jesus was doing This is what it says. First thing, there's two responses we see in this text. First is that everyone who saw it and everyone who heard this, they were astonished. They said, could this be the son of David? Meaning, could this be the Messiah? Could this be the savior of the world? Could this be the one in which we've been waiting for? Could this be the one who's going to restore all things and bring forgiveness and rescue us and restore our relationship with God? Could this be the one? And they were astonished, this text says. However, there was others in the crowd that also had seen what Jesus just did and also had heard of what Jesus did but rather than being astonished and producing in them this sense of belief they did not believe they were not astonished but rather they said this guy is of the devil he's doing all that he's doing and he's saying all of these things in the name of the devil In other words, they saw the miraculous healings with their own eyes and they heard Jesus teaching with their own ears and yet they refused to believe who he was. And so I want you to notice what Jesus says next after this moment when Jesus did this and he saw what these Pharisees were doing. I want you to notice what Jesus did next. Look at verse 25. It says this. Jesus knew their thoughts. That's the Pharisees, the religious elite, the ones who saw with their eyes and heard with their ears and yet refused to believe. So Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom your people, by whom do your people drive them out? So then they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. So let me try to explain to you what Jesus is saying here in this text. Here's Jesus saying three things. First of all, he is saying that what the Pharisees are, were saying was illogical. He was also saying that what the Pharisees were saying was inconsistent and what the Pharisees were saying was completely and utterly defiant. So let's just quickly look at those. He said, he's basically saying in the first part of this that what the Pharisees, those who were refusing to believe, what they were saying was completely illogical. Jesus responds to the Pharisees and he says, what you just said does not make any sense. It is illogical. Notice what he says. He says, every kingdom divided against itself will be in ruin. And every city or household divided against itself will will not stand. 
If Satan drives out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? So what essentially Jesus is saying here to the Pharisees is that if you want a sure way to ruin your kingdom, if you want a sure way to destroy your kingdom, have your kingdom work against itself. If you want a sure way to destroy your workplace in which you work in, then have the workers fight and argue and combat against each other. If you want a sure way that your family will be destroyed, then have everyone in your family live for themselves, for their own desires, for their own wants, for their own privileges, and have everyone fight for their own desires, for their self. Then you will see your kingdom divided and destroyed. You see, Pharisees, what you're saying and what you're accusing me of, that I'm doing all of this out of Satan's power, is completely illogical. Why in the world would Satan cast out a demon from someone who is being tormented by the demon who is exactly there because what Satan wanted in the first place? Why would Satan do this? There is no logical reason, there is no point why Satan would cast out one of his own when that demon is doing exactly what Satan wants. It does not make any sense, Pharisees, what you're saying. And then he moves on from there and he says, not only does it not make any sense, he says, what you're saying isn't even consistent. Look at verse 27, he says, if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your people drive them out? So then they will be your judges by what you just said to me. In other words, what Jesus is saying is, Pharisees, you drive out demons yourself from people who are possessed. If you cast out demons, then by whose power do you do it? Because if you're accusing me of casting out demons in Satan's power, then who are your, who are you casting out? By what power are you doing this? Essentially what Jesus is saying is, come on boys, if you say that I'm casting out uh, uh, demons in Satan's name and in his power, then you too must be doing it. And because you're saying it's to me, well then you be your own judge. Then you be your own jury on by the power of which your Pharisees, your brothers are doing it. So what Jesus is saying is, if you're going to accuse me of something, at least be consistent by saying that your own are, do, are doing it the same way. But not only is he saying that it's you know, illogical and, and it's inconsistent, he also then goes even further and he says, what you're saying is completely defiant. It's completely defiant. And Jesus gives them a warning here in this text. Look at verse 28. He says, but if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, in fact, that's what I've been telling you, that I'm doing this in God's name. If, in fact, it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come to this world and come upon you. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's, strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder his house, meaning... If you really want to cast out uh, Satan and cast out demons and tie them up, you don't go into a strong man's house and, and you plunder his house knowing that he was right there. In other words, what Jesus is saying is, Pharisees, what you just said here, or what, 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 what I just did to this man's life in healing him from demon possession and being blind and mute, casting out this demon, is not by the power of Satan, but in fact by the power of God. And the reason you aren't amazed and astonished like everyone else, and the reason why you are not saying that, are you the son of David? Is because if you do, you would be acknowledging that I am in fact the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the one who you need to worship and follow and obey. Pharisees. Hear my words. You have seen my miracles. You have heard my teaching. You have now just encountered 
me. But yet in your stubbornness and in your defiance, you refuse to believe. So I want you to notice what Jesus says next. Look at verse 31. He gives them a grace-filled and loving warning. If I could say it like this, it's like a father or mother who is, goes to their children or goes to their child, seeing them go down a road or going down a path that is going to be destructive, and he lovingly or they lovingly calls them back home. Don't go down there. Don't follow this path. And so Jesus gives them a grace-filled, loving warning because he so desperately wants them to not go down this road. And so this is what he says. And so I tell you, Pharisees, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven. Time out. If you have your own Bibles, you need to circle that. If you have a mirror in your home, you need to write it on your mirror. You need to put it somewhere where you can see it every day. Take a moment and just soak in that first part of that passage. Let me read it again. It says these words, and so I tell you Pharisees, or I tell you church, every, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven. Everything, everything can be forgiven. And he goes on, but, but Pharisees, please hear me. Please hear these next words. But blasphemy or profanity or refusing to believe or looking the other way or closing your ears or rejecting Jesus in your heart, blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, you got to know, will be forgiven. But anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven either in this age or in the age to come. That is one of the harshest words in the Bible. So church, the question is, is what is the unpardonable sin? What is the sin where there is no forgiveness? There's no do-over. There's no second chance. What is it? So before I answer that question, let me just tell you what it's not. Let me give you two things that it's not. The unforgivable sin is not a relapse into sin after you surrender your life to Christ or you become a Christian. That's not the unpardonable or sin without forgiveness. Church, the unforgivable sin is not the fact that you may still find yourself giving into sin after you've surrendered your life to Christ. That is not the unpardonable sin. It doesn't mean that you enjoy it. It does not mean you wage war on that sin. It just simply means that that is not the unforgivable sin. You can still be forgiven. The unforgivable sin is, is not unbelief in Jesus. That's not the unforgivable sin. If you're struggling here this morning or watching online and you're struggling to believe in Jesus, wondering, is he really who he says he is? Is he really the Savior? Is it really him that I need to follow and obey? Is he really the Son of God? If you're struggling understanding that or believing that, that is not the unforgivable sin. And it's also not those moments after you surrender your life to Christ where maybe there's a moment where you had that moment of question. Is Jesus really who he says he is? It's not that moment where you experience death of a loved one and you're struggling, or it's not that moment where you face health conditions and you're struggling in your faith. It's not that moment where something as terrible has happened to you and you find yourself wrestling or struggling in faith. That does not mean you are wrestling or you've committed the unpardonable or unforgivable sin. It just simply means you're wrestling in your faith. So the unforgivable sin is not if you find yourself uh, sinning, or it's not if you find yourself wrestling in faith, that is not the unforgivable sin. So, what is it? 
So let me just share it with you. The unforgivable sin is when you have heard who Jesus is, like we saw in this story, or you've encountered Jesus Christ, or you felt the Holy Spirit's tug in your heart, his voice inside of you, or his nudge at some point, and you know who God, Jesus is, that he is God, and yet you refuse. You say, no, 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 I'm not going, I'm not listening, I'm not following. It's that constant no, no. You know, you understand, and no, no. The unforgivable sin is committed over time when someone who knows who Jesus is they have heard about him. They've maybe even experienced him. They have felt the Holy Spirit's conviction inside of them. They've heard his voice. They've felt his, you know, his moving inside of them. They've felt the conviction, and yet they say no. They refuse to believe, or they refuse to surrender, or they refuse to obey. They say no. I know it. But I'm not going to listen. I'm not going to follow. That's the unpardonable sin. Let me just be clear for a moment here. It's not the unforgivable sin because somehow this sin trumps God's forgiveness. It's not that this sin is so great and God's forgiveness is somehow trumped that he cannot forgive this. It's, that's not what, what it means. This sin is unforgivable only because the person who commits it understands who Jesus is. Understands why he came to this world. Understands that forgiveness is freely being offered to that individual and yet in time, over time, refuses to reach out and receive that forgiveness. Let me try to explain it in a different way if you're having a hard time understanding this, and hopefully this will help. We see in the Old Testament that God the Father was active in humanity. In fact, God the Father was so active in humanity that he chose a nation called Israel and said, I want you to be my chosen people. I want you to live in such a way that all of humanity would be able to see you and they would be able to see a relationship with, the, uh, with their heavenly father, what that could look like. So I want you to live this way so it would be so inviting. I want you to demonstrate what this relationship could look like so that if anyone turns to me, they will receive forgiveness. And so we see God the Father all the way through the Old Testament wanting to communicate that forgiveness is there, that salvation is there. However, if those who lived in the Old Testament refused to see, refused to obey, then there was no other way. There was no other way. However, in the New Testament, Jesus steps on the scene. Jesus, the, our one and only, the one who told us that he was sent from God the Father, the one that we see him communicating all of the truth of the Old Testament was embodied by him, the one who demonstrated that he had come to seek and to save that which was lost, the one who lived a perfect life, a one who kept the law to the T, the one who went to the cross, the one who eventually died on the cross, and the one who became our substitute, who took on our place, who took our sin, who died and then offers salvation for all. However, if those who lived in the New Testament knew this and understood this and the Holy Spirit was prompting them to believe in this and revealing it to them, and yet if they rejected and said, no, no, I don't want to believe, I do not want to see, then there is no other way. There is no other way for them to receive God's forgiveness. There was no other way. And so the church was born in the book of Acts. Jesus had now passed away. Do you remember what Jesus said before he went to his father? He said, I am leaving, but I am, remember, sending someone to this earth 
who is going to come and convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment, who is going to be active in this world right now in our day and age, who is going to be drawing people to God the Father, who's going to be revealing to mankind who Jesus is, and the Holy Spirit is going to be at work. And yet, if we have the Holy Spirit's prompting inside of us, and we say no, no, I do not want to listen, I do not want to follow, I do not want to believe, then there is no other way. There is simply no other way. God the Father has spoken and revealed. Jesus has come to this earth. He died on the cross. The Holy Spirit has now revealed and showed even into the depths of our hearts. God has done everything. There's nothing left for God to do. And so Jesus says, Pharisees, please watch your next steps because eternity is now hanging in the balance for you. That's the unforgivable sin. It's when we know and we believe and we understand and yet we say no, 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 I am not going to listen. And then at some point, it's not because God is unforgiving or, or, his, unforgi or his forgiveness is, is not trumped. It's just simply, all right, okay. And there's no forgiveness. There's no do-over. There's no second chance. So the question is, what should this cause us to do? This is a hard message. It's certainly not necessarily a great message for a pandemic, but what should this cause us to do? Can I give you three things in response to this message? Three things. It should cause us to take a deep breath. It should cause us to take a deep breath because I want to remind you of verse 31 in this passage. Do you remember what verse 31 says? I hope you've circled it. I hope you highlighted it. I hope you have made a mental note. I'm going to write it on every single mirror in my home. It says this, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven. Oh, thank God. Thank God for this. This verse, verse 31 of Matthew chapter 12, is perhaps one of the greatest verses in, in the entire book of the Bible. And what this just told us, church, is that every sin can be forgiven. Every sin that you commit, every thought that you have, every deed that you've done, every inaction that you've not done can be forgiven. Hallelujah. That is such good news to us. And that should cause us to take a deep breath. Oh, I don't I need to wrestle. I don't need to struggle. I don't need to feel unworthy. I don't need to feel unlovable. Because there is a Savior who can forgive any and all my sin. Hallelujah. It should cause us to take a deep breath. But it also should cause us to take a deep look inside of ourselves. For those who have yet to surrender, or maybe new to church, or watching online, and you're just checking all of this out, and who may be searching, it should cause us to take a serious moment, a serious look, a deep look inside of us, and ask the question, who is this Jesus? Why did he come? And the words of Jesus when he was here, what, what are they offering? Is it true? Is it real? And then it should take us, cause us to take a deep look inside and ask the question, how am I going to respond to this? How am I going to respond to this man named Jesus who is a real person in this world? should cause us to take a deep breath. should cause us to take a deep look inside of our own lives 
and take a moment of serious contemplation. Who is this Jesus? And what is he offering? And it also should cause us to take a stand. For those of you who have surrendered your life to Christ, for those of you who are trusting in your salvation in Jesus Christ alone, it should cause you to do two things. The first thing it should cause you to do is worship like you've never worshipped before, whether with masks on or with masks off. It should cause you to fall to your knees and worship because you have a gracious heavenly Father who is willing to forgive you of every and all sin, who is saying, come home to me. Doesn't matter how far you've gone, doesn't matter how long you've gone, been there, come home to me. I am here. He is your Father, your Heavenly Father is beckoning you home. He's saying, come home. It should cause you to worship. I'm telling you, church, this place, whether we have a mask on or off or when we can get rid of the mask, it should cause this place to erupt every single time we get to sing and worship and be underneath His word should cause us to take a stand and worship like we've never worshipped before. But it also, Christian, should cause us to take a look and take a stand on the sin in our life. Who am I truly following? Who am I truly believing? Am I killing the sin? Yes, it is God's forgiveness is going to cover over all of my sin, but am I killing the sin in my life? Am I listening to the Holy Spirit, or am I in my life, even though you have assurance of salvation, even though your salvation is secure, Christian, there are moments where we could even say, no, When the Holy Spirit prompts us, when the Holy Spirit is convicting us, we can still say that no. So it should cause us to say, am I listening to the Holy Spirit? Even though your salvation is secure, even though nothing can take that away, there are moments where we can still be disobedient. So Christian, if you're here this morning, if you're watching online, are you taking a stand? Are you worshiping like you've never worshiped before? And are you killing sin? Are you listening to the Spirit's conviction inside your heart? So here's how I want to close this service. I want to give you one song. I want to give you maybe what, a song is three, four minutes. I want to give you three, four minutes. If you're in this room, if you've yet to surrender your life to Christ, if you're wrestling, is Jesus, is he really who he says he is? I want to give you three to four minutes for you to seriously take a moment of contemplation and ask yourself, who is this Jesus? And how am I gonna respond? And if you're here this morning and you have surrendered your life to Christ, I wanna give you three to four minutes as this song plays for you to ask the question, how am I living my life? Am I worshiping? Do I understand that I am forgiven? And am I listening to the Holy Spirit? I wanna give you that time as we listen to this song. I wanna encourage you. You may wanna stand. You may want to just sit there. You may want to just simply put out your hands as you sit there as a, as a way of just saying, God, I'm yours. You may even want to get on your knees and put your elbows on a chair in a posture of surrender. And once again, say, God, I'm yours. I want to encourage you. There's, I know we're wearing masks, but there's a multitude of ways we could still worship I want you to take three to four minutes during this song. Who is Jesus? How are you going to respond? And are you going to listen to the Holy Spirit? And I'll come back and close this service. carried a burden for too long on my own. 
I wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation to let it all go. Yeah, I see it now. I'm laying it down. And I know that I need you. I run to the Father, fall in the grace. I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a searching, my soul needs a friend. So I run to the Father again and again. You saw my condition, had a plan from the start. Your son for redemption, the price of my heart. And I don't have a context for that kind of love. I don't understand it, I can't comprehend but all I know is I need you. I run to the Father, fall in the grace. I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a searching, my soul needs a friend. So I run to the Father again and again. My heart has been in your sight long before my first breath. Running into your arms is running to life from death. Oh, I feel this rush deep in my chest. Your mercy is calling out. Just as I am, you pull me in, and I know I need you now. My heart has been in your sight long before my first breath. Running into your arms is running to life. Would you bow in a word of prayer with me as we just close off this service? Father, as we just heard that song. Father, we are so grateful that you are a God that is offering forgiveness time and time again. Father, we, we can run into your arms. 
But Father, there are moments in our life, there's moments where we recognize our failure, our incredible need of a Savior, of forgiveness. And we are, thank you so profoundly that you are a God that over and over and over and over and over again can forgive us. God, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your forgiveness. God, I pray for those either in this room or watching online or those we know that we interact with, the, the ones that you've placed by our side in, in our workplace, in our community, in our neighborhood, that we're interacting with, that may be feeling that they've done something too grand, too great, too awful, that there's no way that they would ever be able to receive forgiveness. I pray, Father, that not only would we know that you are God of grace and mercy and forgiveness, and we would believe that deep inside of us, but I also pray that as a church, we would be communicators of that. We would be an extension of your forgiveness, an extension of your grace, an extension of your mercy to those around us. And I pray that we would be proclaimers of your mercy, your grace, your love, your forgiveness to those who are in desperate need. And God, I pray that if we hear your voice, whether it is a small, soft voice or it is a loud conviction deep within our soul, I pray that we would not say no, Father. I pray that we would hear your loving concern, your loving warning. And we would respond. So Father, would you do your work that only you could do in amongst us here and always online and those who may be watching this and those who we may interact with. God, would you do your work in our lives. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, church, we are so glad that you've been able to worship with uh, with us this morning. I want you to be able to go knowing that God is a gracious God, a loving God. I want to encourage you that you do not need to leave right away. If you need some time just to pray, to, to worship some more, or, or, you know, just do some business, you can more than welcome to stay in this place. And for those of you who know Anita Ambridge, uh, her husband is Dean, two sons are Curtis and, and Mackenzie. Uh, the funeral is going to be here on Wednesday at uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It is going to be a small funeral for uh, family and friends. But if it's something that uh, you're interested in, wanting to get connected with them or send them a card or send them flowers, please don't hesitate. Call the church office. We'd love to let you know how you could do that or even be a part of this, this, this service, the funeral service here on Wednesday. Church, God bless you. Thanks for worshiping with us. And those online, God bless you. We'll see you back next week.